Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining the Garrison Institute's live interactive webinar. Our guests today are Robin Stern and Mark Brackett. Robin Stern is the co-PhD, is the co-founder and associate director for the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and associate research scientist at the Child Study Center at Yale. She is a licensed psychoanalyst with 30 years of experience treating individuals, couples, and families. Mark and Robin are the co-developers of Ruler, an evidence-based approach to social and emotional learning that has been adopted by over 2,000 schools across the United States and in other countries. Both Robin and Mark consult with large companies, including Facebook and Google, on best practices for integrating the principles of emotional intelligence into training and product design. Uh, Robin's work is frequently published in popular media outlets, such as Psychology Today, Huffington Post, Time.com, The Washington Post, Harvard Business Review. Mark Brackett, PhD, is founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and professor of Child Study Center at Yale School of Medicine at Yale University. His research, his research focuses on the role of emotions and emotional intelligence in learning, decision-making, creativity, relationships, health, and performance. Mark is the co-founder of OG Life Lab, a digital emotional intelligence learning system for businesses. His research has been featured in popular media outlets such as the, such as the New York Times, USA Today, Good Morning America, and NPR. He is the author of Permission to Feel, Unlocking the Power of Emotions to Help Our Kids, Ourselves, and Our Society to Thrive. Before we begin today's session, I'll go over a few logistical items about our gathering. We're on a Zoom webinar, so participant audio and video are turned off. And for the time being, you will only see myself and then Robin and Mark. For anyone unable to attend live, we are recording these sessions. You'll have a chance to view these recordings and others uh, as a, well as a schedule of our upcoming programs at garrisoninstitute.org. We offer these sessions free of charge as a goodwill gesture to support our community during such times of uncertainty. We would welcome donations of any amount to help us continue to offer these sessions. Thank you. Finally, we'll have time for Q&A during this gathering. You can post your questions in the Q&A panel, which is accessible at the bottom of your screen by hovering your arrow over the Q&A button. We're on for an hour today and we'll respond to as many questions as we can. Please forgive us if we uh, are unable to get to your question. Thank you again, Mar Robin and Mark, for being with us today and I will turn it over to you. Wonderful. Robin, would you like to just say Thank something you. to get started? Yeah, just I'm thrilled to be here. It's, we've been, um, participants in many Garrison events and uh, been affiliated with Garrison for a very long time and love the work you do there and are honored to to be part of this series. And hi, everyone. Mark? Yeah, hi, everybody. I'm Mark Brackett and super excited to be here with all of you today. Robin, you forgot to mention that we actually met at Garrison Institute. I did forget to mention that. It was a um, leadership retreat some time ago when we sat across the room from each other and and uh, people were talking about the different programs in emotional intelligence. And at that time, just for all of your information, I was at Columbia and Mark was of course at Yale. And I just really liked what he had to say because he was joking and kidding around with people at a time where everyone was being very serious. And I thought, you know what? I wanna know that guy. And so we, we had lunch together that day and began to talk about adults and how important it is to have adults, um, offer adults the training that we were offering kids as well to be the models. And that's how we got started. That's right. So now we're gonna get started again. I'm gonna just put up our slides. And you may tell a few jokes along the way. <clears throat> we'll see, I'm not sure I'm in the right mood for that today, but <laughs> we'll see how it goes. All right, everybody, so welcome again. And uh, as you now know, I'm Mark and that's Robin, and we both uh, 
are the leaders with others of the Center for Emotional Intelligence at Yale. That center is now a team of 50 plus people who are scientists, practitioners, all essentially running around the world trying to get people to talk about their feelings and maybe how to use their feelings a bit more wisely than they have in the past. And uh, one of our signature programs is called Ruler, which is uh, an approach to social and emotional learning that is now in about 2,500 schools around the United States and in other countries. And we'll talk a little bit about that today, but mostly talk about uh, a lot of the concepts in my most recent book called Permission to Feel, uh, that uh, and an extra focus on healthy emotion regulation during these very difficult times. And we like to stay in touch, so those are Robin's and my websites. And also, um, if you're gonna do tweeting, you can do all that today as well, if you're interested. Turn over to Robin. So, thank you, Mark. Uh, so we like to start, begin at the beginning with a quote. And this is one of our favorites and it feels especially meaningful right now. So as I read it, just see what resonates with you. And if you want to, we'd love to hear your thoughts about what's resonating with you in the chat room. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. By Haruki Marukami. And I'll read it again, so we can really take it in. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. What comes to mind for you when you read this, when you hear this? What words or phrases have particular resonance with you? transformation. Thank you, Terry. Courage. Thank you, Michelle and Colleen. You won't be the same person. Change. History. Hurricane Sandy, yes, we won't be the same. Resilience. COVID, yes. Thank you. Evolved. Growth. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Mark. So if you know the work of our center, then you have probably seen a tool that we call the Mood Meter. And if not, welcome to your new life. So the Mood Meter is our tool to help build emotional awareness and many other things. On the X axis, it says the word pleasantness. So everybody just take a moment right here, right now. It's four o'clock on a Tuesday on September 15th. How are you feeling? Minus five, you're saying to yourself something like, cannot believe I'm attending this webinar with this guy named Mark and this lady named Robin. That would be unpleasant. <laughs> Minus three, you're thinking to yourself, you know, I could be here or whatever. Zero, you're neutral. Plus three, you're like, oh my goodness. Plus five, you have no words. On the y-axis, it says the word energy. Do you feel tired and depleted of all your resources or do you feel energized? So check in there. What is your body telling you? And what I'd like you to do right now is plot your color. What color are you in today? Everyone give us a color. You got three seconds to just get into the chat box and type in your color. How are you feeling? So we got yellow, high energy and pleasant. We got greens and blues and turquoises. A lot of creative people on this call.
Okay, so we've got the whole emotion circumflex um, on this call. Interesting. What I want you to do now is take three seconds and convert your color to the best feeling word or words. You've got three seconds. Two, go. The feeling word, not the color now. Okay, we've got lots of words from hopeful to content to ambivalent to satisfied to spacious. Good, even content. Stable. Quick question for you. Um, did you notice that there was a little bit of a hesitation or a struggle finding the best word? Did anyone go through that process of like, ah? Oh, I'm not sure I can find the, the precise word. Just give me a yes or no for that. Does it feel mm -hmm. a little, like you notice that hesitation? A lot of yeses, some noes, yeah. Um, what we find in our research is that it's hard to label our feelings. The color is pretty easy, right? It's a yellow, but like what shade of yellow? Are you elated, ecstatic, jubilant? Blue, are you down, disappointed, devastated, hopeless, full of despair? Red, are you peeved, irritated, angry, enraged, or livid, or green? Are you calm, content, peaceful, tranquil, or relaxed? Huh. That was a lot of work. Um, a lot of us aren't trained to have that vocabulary. Here's the next question for you. We're going to be here for about 45 more minutes. What's the strategy that's going to best serve you? Given how you're feeling, maybe decide on how you'd like to feel. And then what's the strategy that you believe will help get you there? And just take a moment, like what's going to support you in having the best possible webinar with Mark and Robin? <clears throat> to maintain your yellow or green potentially, or to shift out of the yellow into the green, or manage your blue effectively or red? Focus on the now. Present, staying focused. Staying focused on us. Present, being aware. Breathing consciously. Listening. So let's take a moment. We've got lots of great strategies. Thank you for sharing those. <clears throat> let's imagine maybe some of you have children, grandchildren, some of you might be educators, the list goes on, and you're working with your three children. One of our staff members has four children, all in elementary or preschool. Um, she's a full-time researcher at the center and has these four kids. And they're all in different places in the morning. Some want food, some want running around, some want mommy's attention, some want daddy's attention, some want whatever. And how many of you think that you just walk into the kitchen during breakfast where it's chaos and you say, everyone, I want you to focus today. And if that doesn't work, boys and girls, my dearest children, I want you to just, just breathe in and out slowly. Or if that doesn't work, come on. Let's just be present. There's nothing better than the present moment. And if that doesn't work, just let's focus on the now. Think about it. The past, it's gone. And like, if you watch the news and think about the future, like, we don't want to go there. Let's just stay here. Let's just stay here and now. What are your thoughts? Some of you are laughing. Some of you are cursing right now. Um, and these are not, the goal that I have right now is not to make fun of you, but it, I don't know about you, but during this pandemic, multiple pandemics, it's been hard for me to focus. It's been hard for me to be present. It's been hard for me even to be a good listener. It's even been hard to breathe. Does anybody relate to that? Like during these very challenging times, it's been hard to regulate. So that's what we're going to try to focus on right now. What we know from our research is that that way people are feeling right now is guess what? 
Anxious. Number one word used among 6,000 people in a recent study. And this is how kids are doing. Frustrated, bored, anxious, sad. Does this relate to any of you? And so I think it's easy for us to say that how we feel is out of balance. Right? We're spending upwards of 90% of our days in that red and blue, but we're not getting on that for that yellow and green. And so one of the questions is, like, is it realistic to just like, I'm going to drop that red and blue right out of my life and just be yellow all the time. How many of you feel like that's realistic? I'm just going to get, I'm going to leave my anxiety, you know, in my bathroom in the morning before I go down to see my kids. Or I'm going to drop my uh, frustration and just show up for work. It doesn't work that way, right? Our brains don't operate that way. And I think a lot of the books that have been written over the last decade or so, you know, about happiness and your pursuit of happiness and your finding happiness and could be misguiding, right? Is the goal to just drop our feelings and be happy or to have greater emotional balance, perhaps? Just a quick um, snapshot of data. We know that the mental health in America pre-COVID was in a pretty bad place from adverse child experiences to anxiety disorders to depression and anxiety. 40% um, of college students last year reported feeling depressed. Can imagine what it's like this year. I mean, these data are quite alarming. 45% increase in the suicide rates in the last 20 years. During COVID, what we know is that there have been tremendous increases in parents saying, I'm anxious and depressed to children kind of not being able to, con to manage their feelings and externalizing to eight times more people likely to report serious mental distress than two years earlier. And I think also what COVID has really shined a light on is the injustices in our society, especially with our BIPOC community, black indigenous people of color communities who are at greater risk for the virus, who have greater need for food, um, for food due to scarcity challenges, to having less quality care. And we know just in the recent research on COVID that there is an equity challenge in terms of who gets support and treatment because black Americans have about two times higher mortality rates than their white counterparts. So we have a lot of work to do. And that's why we have a Center for Emotional Intelligence and Robin. So our vision from the very beginning of founding the Center for Emotional Intelligence 2013 is to use the power of emotions to create a healthier and more equitable, innovative and compassionate society. And how do we begin? We begin for each of us by giving ourselves the permission to feel. The permission to know our, all of our emotions. What does permission to feel mean to you? To know your emotions, to give yourself the permission to know your emotions, to experience them. What does it mean to you personally? Kindness to self, I love that. Freedom, yes. Self-compassion, we have the right to all of our feelings. Belief, comfortable with emotions, aliveness, freedom, compassion, spaciousness. Acknowledge them. Acceptance, acceptance. So we thank you for your responses. It, it seems like, um, and not surprisingly, people know that not everyone has the permission to feel and not everyone grew up in a way where our families gave us the permission to feel. So some of us felt trapped by that. And some of us felt um, are now experiencing relief when we can imagine giving ourselves permission to feel and accepting ourselves when we have the permission to feel. So this webinar was entitled Permission to Feel and more of that. Um, I'm gonna ask the author, 
uh, permission to feel, Mark, uh, to, can you tell us about why you wrote the book and how you came up with this title? I think it would be great for people to hear. Sure. Um, I mean, I think given the timing of this webinar, you know, and how much anxiety and stress that people are experiencing and, you know, what I can say is that, you know, a lot of us have not given ourselves the permission to feel anxious and overwhelmed and sad. Uh, especially right now, we think we have to suppress it and repress it or deny it or or we act it out in weird ways. And that was my life, you know, as a kid, because um, as you know, Robin, I was abused as a child by a neighbor. Um, and I grew up in a family that loved me, but didn't really know a lot about feelings. And so for, I would say the first 12 years of my life, I suppressed, repressed, denied, you know, myself, my feelings. And it's, it's a weird term because I had the feelings, but they were locked inside of me. The fear, the disgust, the anger, the rage, the sadness, the anxiety, the low self-esteem. And so the reason why I titled my book Permission to Feel is that I realized that not everybody has my life experiences. Everybody's got their own life experiences. Some people grew up in these perfect little homes, but I still, even in those circumstances, find that people did not talk about their feelings. You know, there's so many people that don't believe they can be their true feeling selves um, with themselves, with their lovers, with their children. Dads come up to me and say things like, I can't believe how much, how vulnerable you are, that telling people about your experiences, I would never let my child know that I was bullied because he would think I was weak. And so that seems like the predominant mindset you know, that I hear. And the last thing I'll just say here is in the process of writing this book, um, we were doing trainings for one of the nation's most difficult, challenged school districts. And the long story short is that we were online at lunch one day and I asked one of the principals of the schools, like, what do you think? And he looks at me and he goes, the lunch looks like it's going to be pretty good. And I was thinking to myself, oh, yeah. like, he's going to be my project. And the following day at the end of the training, I took a risk and I just said, you know, listen, this is a big commitment. We got like a lot of schools here to do this training with and principals buy-in really matters. So where are you? And this gentleman stood up and he looked around the room at a hundred other administrators and he just started crying. And he said, thank you for giving me the permission to feel. And I was like, that's the title. So, um, you know, I think it has depth to it. And the last thing I'll say is that I was blessed to have an uncle who was from New York State, actually, um, who was the only adult in my life who listened to me, who understood me, who didn't judge me, and gave me that permission to feel. And that's my Uncle Marvin, who I dedicated my book to. So Mark, um, I have a question before I have a question for, for all of our participants. How did you know that Uncle Marvin was giving you the permission to feel? Because you say, when Mark, he, you have the permission to feel. What, what happened? Well, when he, he happened to be studying to get his master's degree in my hometown, and he would stay with, stay with us on the weekends. And unlike my mother, who was having kind of nervous breakdowns every other minute and having, you know, fits, and my father, who was just angry a lot, Uncle Marvin just sat with me and he'd say, so how's it going? How are you feeling? And his facial expression, his body language, his vocal tone was so welcoming. And then when I share with him all my trauma and challenges and bullying and sexual abuse, he didn't make a facial expression that was like, oh my goodness, like there's something wrong. He just said, my goodness, let's talk about this. What do you need? How can I support you? Not like get some grit kid or toughen up. It was just unconditional love, unconditional support. All the things that people said. He acknowledged me. He made me feel safe. I felt accepted. It was relieving to be, and, you know, he had compassion. So, yeah. So glad I had a chance to get to know Uncle Marvin because mm -hmm. he still, he still was all those things, accepting and welcoming and, and ready to listen. He was always pre present and ready to listen. So I wonder after listening to Mark's story, and thank you for that story, for all of you, who was your Uncle Marvin? You who know, was Mark someone 
Yeah. I was going to say, you know, one of the things that I learned on my book tour was, and I asked this question a lot, not everybody had an Uncle Marvin. Not everybody had an Uncle Marvin. Yeah. And if you didn't have an Uncle Marvin, mm -hmm. is there someone you can be an Uncle Marvin to? Teachers along the way. Yeah. Or someone's grandma, Sister Peg, your grandma. Yeah. Doesn't just, I, I love the person, um, the response teachers along the way because it doesn't have to be just one person. A series of people who gave you that acceptance and, and created that space. Be an Uncle Marvin to yourself, yes. And you can be. Come to acceptance of your feelings without judgment. Friends, often friends are our first Uncle Marvins. Okay. Thank you. So just to, you know, as we go through this journey, what I'd like to say is that the first step in building any kind of emotional intelligence skill is really this permission to feel from our perspective. That if you don't allow yourself to be your full feeling self and allow your children or your colleagues, your lovers to be their full feeling selves, it's hard to grow from there. You know, there are some people when we do these reflections, they roll their eyes. They're like, I don't want to think about this kind of stuff. And, you know, I have to be careful not to be, you know, a non Uncle Marvin with these people. Um, but I recognize that not everyone is accustomed to kind of reflecting on these kinds of things. And then there are a lot of people who just want to know, like they say, Mark, Robin, what's the data? What's the science? And so in my book, this is chapter two. Um, and I share that with you because that was the, the chapter that had 800, you know, empirical journal articles in it. I mean, I just had so much research to talk about in this chapter because it is no longer like psychologists opinion that emotions matter. It is hard fact that how we feel influences everything from attention to memory to learning to decision making to relationship quality to physical and mental health to performance and creativity. And we can go on and on and on about that, but that you can read about today. We want to focus on really helping you develop some skills and strategies. You know, as you asked me, Robin, what was different about Uncle Marvin? Well, when I thought about him in, in the writing of my book, I was like, what? Well, he was really the first compassionate emotion scientist. Right? He was curious and open and reflective. Um, he was in learner mode. He wanted to get granular. He wanted to know how I really felt. He wasn't satisfied with bleh or fine or okay. He said, no, 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 let's get, let's get here. Let's, mm -hmm. Is it this? Is it that? And I was failing horrifically as a student in school and psychologically. And it wasn't as if like that was the, that was who I was. He had this growth mindset. You know what, Mark? This is how it was. And now we're gonna shape the future about who you could be and who you wanna be. As opposed to the emotion judge, who's kind of like a lot of my colleagues here, unfortunately at the university, right? Some people who are like, you know, oh, this emotional intelligence stuff, right, whatever. Um, you know, I had one professor at a presentation say something like, you know, we don't, we produce Nobel laureates at Yale, not kind people. I remember thinking to myself, we'd have a lot more Nobel laureates if you weren't a professor here, but I controlled myself. Um, That's good. You know, the emotion scientist is open and curious. The emotion judge, knower mode, clumps emotions. Like my father, he was angry a lot and he'd say things like, son, deal with it. This is who I am. I always think to myself, yeah, dad, I've dealt with it like 10 years of therapy and 25 years of research. But um, I think you all get the picture of the difference. Robin, what it's are interesting you to think, skills? yeah, what I was thinking as you were, as you were um, talking about the emotion scientist versus the emotion judge is I'm sure that everybody uh, listening was thinking, well, you know, who, not only who raised me, um, but who am I? I hope you were thinking that. 
like with are you an emotion scientist with everyone are you an emotion scientist with certain people and not others yeah. something to, to take away from this webinar and think about so what are the ruler skills the skills of recognizing understanding labeling expressing and regulating emotions and co-regulating emotions in helpful ways and effectively so that that acronym ruler is our um, approach to bringing social and emotional learning into schools and, and other places. All of these skills, recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating apply to yourself and to other people. And emotion regulation are the, is what we're going to focus on today in particular. Because as Mark said, right now, during this time, people are really having a very tough time coping and managing their emotions. And it's understandable because of the ongoing stress. So we wanted to pay particular attention today to the thoughts and actions that we use, not only to prevent and reduce, but to initiate emotions, to maintain them or enhance them. So think about it. When you have the, your hand on the doorknob of your of your home or the next room when you're home with someone and you know that if you open the door and you see a mess you're going to freak out what can you do to bring that down and i know that even even in my own home during the time that we were on lockdown it was really tough sometimes to go from one room to the next knowing what was in the next room or who was in the next room and not feel triggered already so we use regulation strategies to prevent and to reduce emotions to calm ourselves, but also to initiate at times where we feel kind of down and blue. And, and um, some of us are, are in what's called a amorphous grief right now, ambiguous grief, um, where we just have this blue feeling because of all the sadness around us. How do we initiate emotions when we need to get up and go, or we need to work or do a webinar? Are we maintaining and enhancing emotions to promote your well-being, to build positive relationships, and make those decisions that Mark was just talking about, and in all in the service of your goal. So how do we work with our emotions in the service of our goals? As I was just saying, that this is a very tough time, and Mark, you mentioned it earlier too. I mean, what is more stress-producing provoking than unpredictable, uncontrollable, and sustained anxiety and stress. And many of us are living that around the clock. And coupled with the lack of taking care of ourselves that happens when we're under this kind of stress, often we're our worst selves. And I know we've talked so many times about how we've lost our temper and been impatient with the people we live with. And um, we don't want to be that way all the time. And yet, without the skills of emotional intelligence regulation, it's really hard to live under this kind of sustained stress and not be our worst selves. So what are those skills? As Mark said, it all begins with permission to feel. Then we talk about uh, physiological regulation, and Mark will take you through a mindfulness exercise. And we're going to talk about how we uh, build the foundation for our skills and strategies by taking care of ourselves, taking care of our bodies, taking care of our minds, psychological self-care, and promoting our healthy relationships, doing what we can do to keep our relationships respectful and nourishing and present to our feelings, managing our thoughts, cognitive strategies, and managing our life smartly, making decisions that help us every single day. Thank you, Robin. So this is a group that's part of an organization that really takes mindfulness seriously. So I don't think we need to like explain, you know, the misconceptions and clarifications, but I, you know, in our journeys, you know, a lot of people, you know, are skeptical of mindfulness um, because they think it's a religious practice. They think it's um, about only dealing with you know, down-regulating difficult emotions um, that we have to have our hands in a certain way. And we all know that's not the case. You know, mindful breathing is just helping us be more present. So I thought it would be a good idea in the middle of a webinar or smack down in the middle 
to let everybody just take a little break and stretch out your shoulders if you don't mind. Um, let's roll our shoulders back maybe three times if you're sitting in a seat or even if you're standing and roll them forward three times. Oh, feels good. Maybe stretch out your neck one direction and then the other direction. If you want to, you can lift your hands up and just stretch a little bit. Maybe do a little twisting in your seat. And then let's just bring ourselves to good posture. There, you know, you don't have to have your hands in a certain symbol, you know, right? People do that. It's totally fine, of course. Um, but one thing that is important is to have good posture, right? You don't want to collapse your lungs. So let me ask everyone to get a good straight back. If you want to close your eyes, that's fine. If you'd like to just look down, gentle gaze, that's great too. And let's just take some inhales and exhales. We're just going to breathe naturally. I don't know about you, but my brain over the last six month, months has been trained to be scattered. I'm worrying about the future. I'm worrying about the center that we run. I'm worrying about my research. I'm worrying about my family. I had a relative die from COVID. Um, I'm worrying about the economy and worrying about the elections. I mean, it's like my brain in any given moment could be in 15 different directions. Can anyone relate to that? That like, it's become so easy between social media and the news and life to just be kind of all over the place. And we spend hours each day in that kind of vigilance. And the question is, how much time do we give ourselves to be still? I'm going to ask two minutes of you right now. Let's all take a nice long inhale. And an exhale. Just maybe drop your shoulders a little bit. Put your hands on your thighs if you'd like to do that or on your desk. Many of you know the mindfulness meditation teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, I had the pleasure of studying with him 30 years ago. And an exercise that he taught me, that he taught millions, is the one we're gonna practice right now. So on the inhale, we're just gonna say the word in. And in our exhale, we're just gonna say out. On the inhale, we're gonna say deep. On the exhale, slow. On the inhale, the word calm. And on the exhale, ease. On the inhale, please put a gentle smile on your face. And the exhale, say release. Let's try that one more time on your own pace. In. And out. and deep and slow calm and ease and smile and release all right one word how are you feeling now? Better, relaxed, centered. Lodi. Appreciative. <laughs> so you can see here, it doesn't take a lot of effort. It just takes dedication to just give yourself that permission to be still and to relax and to breathe. We know from research this makes a difference in our health, in our immune function, in our focus, in our anxiety, in our well-being. We just did a study with Yale undergraduates, and the breathing exercises had the strongest impact above all else on their health and wellness. Robin? Thank you for that, Mark. So psychological self-care. 
during this time, it's really hard to find some downtime. Our, our center has been really working, uh, working us nonstop. But what can you do when you have downtime? It's, very, it's completely up to you. It's very unique. Here's a list of some things that we think can be helpful. Shaking up your routine. I know that um, my routine every morning is making my bed. And uh, when I make my bed, I sing a little song to myself of gratitude. And when I got married, I taught it to my husband. And now we both sing a little song of gratitude when we're making our bed. And on gratitude, write a letter. Think about the people you're grateful for, even the essential workers right now. Let them know when you pass them in the street. Tell people, I'm grateful for you. Writing in, some, in a journal or a letter to somebody is always helpful, just letting your thoughts go. And during this time, I've tried many new recipes. And I know many people are telling me they're watching series after series on TV. Helping others is often okay. the best I form. Found for how the series on Oops. TV. Check it out. And there goes my Siri uh, responding to what I just said from across the room. Um, helping others is one way to center yourself. So what about for you? What do you do when you're having downtime? What, do you, what can you do to put every day a little something in your routine? One thing, as you know, Robin, um, from our friend Decker, from um, UC Berkeley that I've been doing is doing my all walks. And I see a right. lot of people doing that. Uh -huh. I've actually been doing it. It's been really helpful to just look up at the sky and look at the trees. And luckily I live 10 minutes from the ocean. And I just like stare at the water and I'm like, this is really different. <laughs> Honestly, I've I kind of feel that way when I, gla when I glaze my carrots with honey, I feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> I just really, I'm um, so grateful that we have fresh fruit out here and, and vegetables so that I can make yummy veggies. Walk in the woods. Many people are joining you on that walk, Mark. One of the things that I think is important to mention here is that our Yale students are trained to believe that downtime is for the weak. Yeah. And it's a terrible mindset to have because they think that all of their creative ideas are going to come from staying up in the library till two o'clock in the morning and pounding out the idea. And what they don't know is that if they just took a walk or did a yoga class or, you know, just did nothing for a little while, they'd have epiphanies because the areas of our brain responsible for generating ideas um, are not activated when we're under pressure. They're activated when we're free. It's a really nice tidbit of science because it's, it's so true to give yourself space. So I want to uh, say a word about self-care. Often self-care has a bad reputation. It, People think it's selfish to, to take care of yourself and to really pay attention to that. One of my favorite quotes, I'll read it to you, it's not up here on the slides, is by a mommy blogger that says, self-care means giving the world the best of you instead of what's left of you. By Katie Reed, a mommy blogger. And I think it's really important. So read this list under taking care of yourself for nutrition. Staying hydrated, drinking water, eating healthy, not turning too often to high sugar, uh, high fat sugar foods. And I'm laughing because I've become addicted to cheesecake during the <laughs> pandemic. But it's really the only time during the day that I have sugar. But I love it. Um, and avoid being hungry because you may be angry. And we call that hangry. When, you're, when your blood sugar is really low, you may find yourself really losing your temper, being irritated just because you're hungry. So staying healthfully new, uh, in food and sleeping, really important. I have I'm very blessed that I usually get a good night's sleep, even though I may not sleep enough. But what is it for you that you need to feel rested in the morning? No devices pre-bedtime is a really good idea. And uh, for some people, light stretching. For other people, a cup of hot tea. For other people, a quiet conversation. What is it for you? And movement. Physical exercise, really important. It decreases anxiety, stress, and you feel better about yourself. Get those endorphins going. 
something that has really been difficult for a lot of people during the pandemic is maintaining healthy relationships. Even in the best of times, people can be strained. But right now, during this time, it's really, uh, it's even harder. We all have basic needs to be seen and heard and met. And be an Uncle Marvin to the people you live with. Be an Uncle Marvin to people in your life. One, one fun fact that uh, we know about empathy is that it's not just the ability to tune in when someone's hurting and sad or grieving and, and join them in the blue quadrant and, and uh, be sad with them. It's really important to celebrate with people to, to, and help them amplify their joy, to give them positive empathy. In fact, we know that it's related to building greater bonds and greater well-being. And Mark and I talk a lot about um, the importance of being the first, the first to initiate joy, the first to apologize, the first to forgive. How many times are you sitting there with crossed arms saying, well, I'm not, forget it. I'm, I'm just not gonna talk to him, not, I'm done with it. Be the first, have the courage to be vulnerable and go first. So let's take a moment and think about what your self-talk has looked like over the last couple of months. Has anyone been a self-saboteur? Has anyone else said unkind things to themselves? Um, it's unbelievable how quickly um, when things go wrong, we start blaming ourselves, we start blaming everybody else, we start saying things like, I'm such an idiot, I can't take it anymore, what's going on, this is crazy. The list goes on. One thing that we've realized over the last couple of decades of research is that much of our negative self-talk is defined by us for uh, by other people. Think about it. We're not born with a negative self-talk gene. It's got to be acquired through experience and that acquisition is generally from our families and our peers and obviously now social media and television. Um, and so the question is, when you mess up, when you're overly anxious, where does your brain go? Because you can't just say, you know, stop thinking that way. Briefly, three great strategies that we know from research work. The first, positive self-talk, saying encouraging words in your head. So what does that mean, really? Well, for me, it's the following. When I'm like really pissed about something, my mother-in-law was living with us for six months. She's from Panama. We could not fly her home because they were not allowing flights to Panama till literally two weeks ago. Um, by the third month, it was like, she actually came for your wedding, Robin. Thank you very much for that. No problem. <laughs> that, was your, that was your gift to my family. For, uh, for I your love wedding. her. <laughs> She's lovely, but she was supposed to be here for two weeks, not six months. And, um, there we came to a time like, are we going to have for dinner? What are we going to do for dinner? And like, how much salt? I don't like salt. She puts salt. I want sugar. She wants sugar. And oh, 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 it's getting crazy. And then I was like, all right, Mark, I'm having really negative thoughts about good old abuela. What am I going to do? Take the high road, Mark, take the high road. I used to, you know, as my role director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence, I would often use that phrase to myself. I'd say, Mark, when you walk downstairs today, remember, you are the director of the Center for Freaking Emotional Intelligence. And it was a way for me to just get perspective, you know, and have a more positive self view of what was happening. Um, reappraisal, looking at the situation in a different lens. So there came time with like dinners. I was like, I cannot have another dinner with this human being. I'm like sick of it. I'm like, how do you look? Come on, Mark, look at this from another perspective. Oh yeah. Why don't we get to know each other better? So we started asking each other really fun questions about like, what was it like for you in middle school? Like, who did you date in high school? And blah, blah, blah. It was actually a learning experience as opposed to an uncomfortable experience. Lastly, what we know from research is that when you have trouble like switching from negative, positive self-talk, a great tip is to give advice. Literally, just say to yourself, what would I tell my best friend who is going through what I'm going through? And you'd be amazed at how distancing yourself from the need for the strategy can help you come up with more strategies. The last thing that we're gonna do because we're running out of time is just thinking about how to manage our lives smartly. Really, this is about 
routines and rituals. Routines and rituals. Think about that. Routines and rituals. Are your routines working for you? Meaning, is the time you go to bed working for you? Is the time you're getting up working for you? Is mealtime working for you? Are you putting in your exercise and movement? Are you giving yourself time in between? We just have a new rule, which, by the way, we're not following at the center, which was 50-minute meetings and 25-minute meetings as opposed to full-hour meetings so that you just have no space. Be a preventionist, right? Try your best to surround yourself with people who are calming versus people who make you walk in eggshells. Stay informed, but don't check the social media so much. And as I said before, think about potentially your best self. So take a moment, everyone, and consider your best self. How do you want to be seen and talked about and experienced right now? Can everyone just think of a word or two as we wrap up our time together about how you'd like to be seen and talked about and experienced? Patient, caring, warm, present, calming, kind. Exactly. Rob and I asked a number of people, a few thousand people over the last couple months, how do you want to be seen and talked about and experienced? And patient came up, you know, in the, in the late spring, I think, because I think people's fuses were just becoming shorter and shorter and compassionate and caring. Just lastly, we know from research that people are desiring people that have this ability. We know from research that adults with these skills are healthier, they're happier, they're more effective. We know from research that children and adolescents, just those who are lower in these skills have more difficulties in life and as you can see on the column on the left and those who have, these, have developed these skills um, fare better in everyday life. Among leaders, we know that organizations where leaders have these skills, there's less frustration and there's a lot more positive emotions like happiness and excitement. I think these data are just unbelievable. When you work in an organization with a leader with higher emotional intelligence, you're more likely to learn new skills. You're less likely to want to leave your job. You're satisfied more, less burnout, greater engagement. You're more comfortable speaking up when there's a problem and you're actually um, in a place that you believe is more ethical. So Robin, let's take people through a final exercise and then we'll jump yeah. into the questions. So think about the strategies that we discussed. Self-care, mindfulness, physiological regulation, giving yourself permission to feel, psychological self-care, eating, sleeping, and um, moving managing your life smartly, which strategy, oh, importantly, self-talk and positive uh, reappraisal and giving advice, cognitive strategies. Which strategy or strategies can you commit to using, like right now, when you walk out away from this webinar, what are you saying to yourself or what could you say? I'm gonna make a commitment to be more positive in the way I talk to myself, be kinder in the way I talk to myself. I'm going to give other people the benefit of the doubt and reframe. I'm going to get more sleep. I'm going to eat less sugar. Positive empathy. Positive self-talk. Thank you. Tell us. To cooking. I recommend carrots. A lot of sugar, Robin. <laughs> Be a good listener. And what will be different as a result of using that strategy? And who will notice? What will be different in your life as a result of your using a new strategy? And who will notice? People are going to be more patient. Be a better person. Self-talk. Calm, caring, and spacious. So people are saying they, they'll have more energy, connect better with others. Who will notice 
when you use these strategies going first make me this will make me calmer you owe it to yourself and loved ones to use healthy emotion regulation strategies i would say that's for sure as mark mentioned i had a wedding recently and um newly married and this was our honeymoon being in lockdown with each other and had wonderful joyous moments and and moments where i thought gee i need to extend more patience luckily your husband will be watching this webinar today <laughs> <laughs> so i want to just jump to questions um one thing i want to share is that robin and i co-developed an app that is available to help you build emotional awareness and track your strategies over time. So please check that out. It's moodmeterapp.com. And just a few final thoughts, and then we're gonna jump into questions. You know, I think hopefully it's clear from Robin and me that the first step is giving yourselves the permission to feel, giving others. Strive to become that emotion scientist and not the emotion judge. Right? Remember that this set of skills is about accepting all feelings and using them wisely. I just want to say appreciate that this is life's work. Um, I've learned all the math I needed to by third grade probably to count my change and do my checking account, maybe fifth grade. Um, but I tell you at 51, I'm still practicing these skills and I'm surprised sometimes at my lack of ability to implement them. Robin, you want to finish the three? Sure. And be the role model. If you, if you don't succeed in a particular interaction, you don't feel good about it, be open to apologizing. Be, don't forget to go first. Forgive yourself and others and spend time repairing. So much more important to focus on repairing when there's an argument than whether or not arguments are okay or who was right. And seek professional help if you can't do it yourself. There's really important. There are people out there who are trained to listen in a different way. Um, and focus on systemic change and embrace its complexity. When we go into a school, we go into a company, even in a family, everyone needs to get on board. And we're changing the culture as individuals build their skill. It's very complicated and it's really rich and textured when it works that way. And don't ever give up doing your part to build a healthier, more equitable, innovative and compassionate society so that all children and adults can achieve their dreams. So thank you for attending. You can read more about our work at our respective websites. Um, I see two quotes, I mean, not two quotes, two questions. Um, Sister Peg, um, you had an interesting question that you're correct. You know, people are getting ill, obviously, from contracting the virus. But at the same time, people's anxiety levels are so high um, I can tell you that I haven't had acid reflux in 20 years and by some wave of a terrible magic wand, I have GERD now all of a sudden. I think it's because I'm just overwhelmed with the beginning of the school year and you know what's happening in the center and we're not going into our offices yet. And it's been six months and where's everybody working and trying to monitor everything. And I could see myself getting worked up. And so, yes, you are correct. We need to work on those strategies. Um, Susie's question, Robin, is some people seem to insist again and again, like there's nothing that could possibly work. Um, I'll just say briefly, you know, when you have somebody like that, it's hard. Um, you might do that technique that I shared earlier, which is just say, you know, if your best friend, if your child came to you and said that, you know, what would you, what would your advice be to them? And just take it, don't try to get that person who is activated to find their own strategies, get them to shift their brain over to someone else. And by doing so, that distance that's created between you know, themselves and the strategy can be very helpful. And then say, you know what? Wow, you were so creative. If you're, if you're recommending all these great things to person Y, hey, let's try these for yourself. Right. And I would just thank, thank you for that, Mark. I think that's really wise. And I, I would just add to that, that I think you need to let go a little bit of trying, which is a different way of saying take some distance. Just let go of that um, constant effort to make somebody feel better or to, to uh, be in a power struggle. Step aside, step out of the power struggle and 
be an emotion scientist, ask good questions and give the person some space to perhaps step in to some positivity. And remember that you really can't be responsible or change anyone but yourself. So it is possible that somebody will, for whatever reason they need to, hold on to their negativity for longer than you would want them to. And perhaps they will live their way into a different answer or a different way of looking at something because you've given them the permission to feel. One question, um, and we'll make this the last one, is around, you know, you're having uncomfortable feelings and it's hard to access the strategies. Um, that's why I'm a firm believer in discovering your go-to strategies. So for me, for example, that meditation that I took everyone through, in, out, deep, slow, it's my go-to strategy always when I'm having trouble sleeping. I just make it my default and I stick to it and it just, all of a sudden I fall asleep. When I'm in, when I used to travel like tremendously and running around and missing planes and getting totally irritated, I would remember this phrase, Mark, you know this feeling is impermanent. And all of a sudden I'd be like, yes, I felt anxious 500,000 times before and I've been better the day after. So like this is temporary. With my interpersonal relationships, I often use, you know, my, my Mark, be the role model. You're the director of the Center for Emotional Intelligence. So try to develop those go-to strategies. They can be really helpful. Robin, any suggestions from you? Well, what I like about what you're saying, Mark, is, is that you um, have included yourself in the circle of people you have compassion for. And I would say that that's something um, that I would definitely recommend to Katie and <clears throat> anyone else who's struggling with that issue because it is hard when you're having uncomfortable feelings to remember your strategies. And whatever you need to do, including saying, this is hard for me, you know, and it's okay. But adding that it's okay allows you to, it encourages you to give yourself compassion that you would give to someone else. It is hard and having something to say to yourself that's ready and quick is a great idea. All right, so thank you. Um, it was a privilege and pleasure to get to present to all of you. And let's not forget the Viktor Franco quote um, that you see in front of you. Just give yourself that space. And in that space, you can practice all these strategies that Robin and I share with you. Hope this was helpful. And thank you. Thank you so much, Garrison, for hosting us. Thank you so much, Robin and Mark. That was so such great information. And as mentioned, um, we will have this recording up on our website in about one or two weeks uh, for your viewing. And uh, thank you all for joining us on this gathering today. Our next session is this Thursday, September 17th with Mary Esther Malloy. Please, checking, please keep checking garrisoninstitute.org for updated listings of future sessions. And again, to view this recording and others. Again, we provide these sessions free of charge. If you would like to support this effort, please consider making a donation at garrisoninstitute.org. May everyone be happy, healthy, and safe. Thank you.